Okay, so around the year 300 of the Common Era, you have a conversation that takes place between Yalta and Rav Chista. Yalta and Rav Chista were husband, at, or were husband and wife. Yalta married Rav Chista. And she, um, there's a number of teachings in the Gemara in where she's quoted, including this one. There are many of the, of the wives of the Talmud Chacham and the Gemara are not mentioned and we know very little about them. But Yalta is one of the exceptions. And she says something fascinating to her husband. And this shtikol gemara is going to serve as the basis for tonight's shir. What does she say? Amra le, this is the gemara in Chulit. Amra le, Yalta le Rav Nachman. Yalta says to Rav Nachman, Michti, let us talk about this. Kol da osar lan rachmana, shara lan kavase. She drops here a general principle. Anything that God forbade to the Jews, he gave something correspondingly that is mutter. Something corresponding that is mutter. And she goes on to demonstrate this point. And she lists a few items. Asar lan dama. He forbade the consumption of blood. Sharalan kavda. He was mater to us, the kaved. The kaved is the liver of an animal. Rashi here says that the liver is kuloidam, is maloidam. And so therefore... Even after it goes through the halachic process of roasting, which the, the halachic way of preparing a liver, you get a little bit of a taste of blood, and so therefore you're able to taste something, you're able to taste blood in a kosher dikkah way. Nida, there's the iser to have relations with a woman when she's a nida, but there's something called dam toya. This actually isn't really practiced anymore today, but there's two types of dam toya. So one is after a woman gives birth. After a woman gives birth and there's bleeding, so the Taita says how many days you need to wait before relations can uh, continue. And the Taita gives specific amount of time. After that time is over, so a husband and wife could be intimate together. Aye, they're still bleeding. It's not Isser Minat Taita. It was much later that the Chachaman came along and said that we're going to get rid of this uh, heter of Dam Taita. And they said this too is forbidden, and that's our minig, the way we behave today. But what he's saying is, that although there's a prohibition for Nida, there's something similar, there's this kind of Dam tire. There's another example of Dam tire, and that also is no longer observed today, and that is Dam Sulim. Dam Sulim, that is when a woman, a Kala, um, suffers uh, a wound uh, because of the first time she's having relations. So that too, Minat Taira, there's no Tuma from that. And theoretically, the husband and wife can continue having relations. The Poyol, already in the time of the, uh, the Tanoim, or the Amaroyim, they said that we should treat this as Tumah, and that's the way we deal with it today. But at least, Min you have examples that are very similar to Nida, and because these are two cases where it's not deemed as period blood, therefore it's Mutter. Number three, Chalev Behema. Chalev Behema is the fat of, a, of an animal. We know there's an Isser of consuming fat, but there's Chalev Chaya, the, uh, the Chela of a Chaya, which means the the, uh, for example, a deer, if, you, if, a pers- if we want us to eat that, that chelav is not osir. Next, chazir, it's forbidden to consume uh, pig products, but you can eat moicha dishibuta. Moicha dishibuta. Moicha dishibuta is the brain of a shibuta, is a type of fish. It's a big discussion what exactly this type of fish is, which we don't need to get into right now. Girusa, it's forbidden to consume a girusa. Rashi tells us girusa is a non-kosher bird. Fine. Lishna dechura. Um, there is a uh, lishna dechura is the tongue of a certain type of fish. Either it's all fish, but Tosis thinks it means of a specific type of fish. The kavra. Lishna de kavra. That's the way to read it. Eisha fish. It's forbidden to have intimate relations with a married woman. But what's the corresponding heter? Grusha. Bechaye Baila. So here, a woman who is divorced, her husband is still around, so another Yid could come along and marry this divorcee. Now her husband's alive, so it's like, you know, he's here, and you're having relations with her, so it's a me'ain, it's uh, in some way similar to the concept of, uh, of adultery. That's what we're learning uh, here. Eishas Ach, it's forbidden to have relations with a sister-in-law, but then there's Yavama, there's Yavama, where not only it's uh, permitted, but it could even be considered a mitzvah. We don't do it today. But uh, 
but in the Torah it's a mitzvah, to, and that's having relations with the sister-in-law. Kusis, so actually uh, kusis is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a result of uh, Talmudic censorship. It used to say here, Goya. Uh, if you remember in a previous class we spoke about the, the Basel Talmud and the censorship that resulted there, and that's where it was changed. Uh, but a non-Jew, a man is not allowed to have relations, a Jewish man is not allowed to have relations with a non-Jew. Okay? Yefash Toyar! We learn in Pashas Kisese that there is a scenario in where uh, you're out at war and uh, the soldier is able to have relations with uh, the, this non-Jewish woman that he finds. Specific dinim on how it's done. But the bottom line is that that's an example. There's a corresponding heter to the prohibition to have relations with a non-Jew. Okay, so now she gave how many examples? One, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. She gave eight examples for her principle. The eight examples proves the rule. And now that she has the rule, she turns to Rav Chista and she says, Ba'inon lemechal bisra b'chalva. I want to have basra b'chalva. Help me out. I want to have basra b'chalva. It must be, she's so confident, there must be a way to consume basra b'chalva in a way that's mutter. Amalahu Rav Nachman l'tavchi. So Rav Nachman told his chef, I guess he had some chef, Zaviku la kachli. Uh, put onto a, 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 um, a roasting stick um, the udder of an animal, of a, of a cow, and you're going to roast it, and it's going to be mutter for her to eat it. There's a whole discussion halacha of how to eat a cow in an udder in a way that's kosher. The, for our purposes, it's enough. He says, just take it, kamoshu, stick it onto a stick, roast it, and then she could eat it. And that's a, a permitted way of eating basar bechalaf. This is a very fascinating Talmudic passage. And um, there's a few imp- uh, 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 big uh, discussions that revolve around it. But f- one of the things that we're going to have to talk about, we'll just, I want to state the question now, is why would there be such a principle? Like why? Why is Yalta so sure that there is uh, such a principle? What's the logic behind such a principle? What's the theology behind it? Why would the Abish should create the wo- world in such a way where there was this type of principle operating? So we're going to learn three or four different explanations, uh, which we'll see in a moment. Obviously, as well, toward the end, we'll get to the discussion how this Gemara affects the modern-day conversation about imitation products and, uh, and, um, and the fact that the uh, L'chayra, it sounds like from here, that there should be no halachic problem with it whatsoever. Okay, but before we get there, I want to just do one other thing. And that is, here there are eight things that are listed. But really, there's a book, there's a safer that's waiting to happen. What I mean is a safer waiting to happen. What I mean is, over the years, since this Gemara has been, uh, this passage of Gemara has been recorded, other scholars, rabbis, have written uh, similar ideas for additional uh, Averis. Similar ideas for additional Averis. And so what's waiting is for someone to push come and collect all of these, and then you'll see how many we have. I don't know how many exist. I didn't start searching and counting. I also don't know to what degree this principle, does this principle apply to all areas. There is a common denominator. The two things that she's talking about are all food or uh, sexual relations. It's, it's those two things. So is it really supposed to expand uh, beyond that? Um, but the fact is that it has. And I'll just show one example of an interesting one because the Rebbe referenced this once by a family. There's a Sefer Pardis Yosef that was written by a Rav who uh, died in, during World War II. And he, he says over there, in, uh, in, in, this is text number two, he writes over there, they asked the Baal Shem Tev, yeah, really? Everything that's forbidden has a corresponding heter? I want to ask you the following question. How is heresy permitted? How is denying Hashem, which is usher, Tell me, what's the corresponding heter for that? So the Baal Shem Tev answers. We're, we're in tzedakah. In tzedakah. What does it mean in tzedakah? So he explained that when it comes to tzedakah, if someone asks you for help, you may feel you want to say, what do you mean, don't believe in the Abish there. Don't you believe the Abish? And by the way, if I don't help you, someone else will help you, right? You can get very God-centric all of a sudden and start saying, the Abish is going to take care of you. So what do you need me to worry about you for? This is a moment where a person has to take God out of the equation, so to speak. And you're only relying on yourself. And in the Lushen, the way the part of the says it, is that you should be a koifer, but oisah shah. That's very, very strong, uh, very strong uh, language. But the Reb quoted this once by Fabreng, we're coming up to Yeral of Nissen, and it was Yeral of Nissen, Tosh Alamed Beis, and the Rebbe mentioned this. 
Rebbe said, not in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, but a story of one of the big daily Yisrael, who mentioned the teaching of the Gemara in Chulin, that every Yisr has a corresponding heter. So they asked him, what about the lack of belief in God? And the Rebbe says, and the answer was, when it comes to giving staka to an Ani, you have to negate the idea of Ein Anu Li Shain Ela Alavinu that we rely only on God. No, in that moment it's not there. So that's the heter, that's the heter moment for the idea of fear. And likewise, there are other, in, I feel like in Sifri Chsidis a little, and especially non Chabad Chsidis, you have other examples of these uh, different types of Isurim where they do these types of, uh, of Vertlach. Okay, but that's not our main thing that we want to do today. Our main thing that we want to do today is to come back to that question. What is the logic behind this? Why does this make any sense? Why should there be this principle in the first place? So as I said, there's a number of explanations. We're going to see one, two, three, four, five, five, five different explanations. So explanation number one is going to be rooted in a passage of Tanchuma. Now what's interesting... Huh? Why should there be a principle that every Isser has a corresponding heter? So the Tanchuma, Mendish Tanchuma, also has a teaching that's very similar to the teaching from Yalta. But it's also interesting is some of the examples are different. Let's read the first few lines. Says the Tanchuma, Don't allow your Yetzirah to fool you into thinking that all good things God forbade to the Jews. No, 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 Amar Kaddish Baruch Hu, that's not true. Kol Masha Sarti Lecha, everything that I forbade, he Tarti Lecha Kenegdoi, I gave you something corresponding uh, that is Mutter Ketzad, and he gives examples. So the first example we already saw, Dam Nida and Dam Sulim. The second example is Dam, and he says Kaved, we saw that one. Chazer, and then he says the Shibuta fish, we had that one. Eisha fish. Grusha uh, fish. We had that example as well. Asar tulcha nachri sananju eishes yifaster. We had that example as well. Asar tulcha eishes ach yevama. We had that example before. Here's the one addition that you have in this passage. Asar tulcha kilayim. You're not allowed to wear kilayim. So now we moved out of food and physical relations into clothing. Okay. And what is it? Hisar tulcha sadin b'tzitzis. Sadin means a garment made out of a flax. And a linen, some made out of linen. And I'll be Torah. If you have a beggar made out of linen, you're allowed to put a wool sets of strings. If you have tchelas with it on your thing, I shotness. You're not allowed to wear wool and linen together. The answer is yeah, that's as Elisha say. But the assay of tzitzis uh, pushes off every assay pushes off a loisha say. So the assay of tzitzis pushes off the loisha say of kalim. Paul, we don't do this for there's multiple problems. Number one, we don't have Tchelas today. Because you don't have tchelas today, it's not the full mitzvah, number one. Number two, what happens if you wear it for a minute by night? And if the shit, and if by night, if there's no chiv in so now you work a line. So there's complications. But the bottom line is, this is the zone of heter that corresponds to the isra of kilayim. Okay, and then the last one is chelav. So we just brought one example, otherwise it matches eight for eight with one additional example. But what's interesting about this medrash is that it starts off what is it? It's giving you a hint about the logic here. Because what does it say? It says, don't let your Yetzirah fool you into saying that all the good stuff is off limits. It's not true. Some of the good stuff, I give you an outlet for the good stuff as well. What does it sound like? It sounds like the principle here is about God accommodating the impulse that we have to uh, eat certain foods or to engage in a certain type of relationships or to wear certain clothes. And there's an like, there's impulse there. And it's like, if it's not given a good outlet, then it's going to go uh, to the negative. So the Eidusha, so to speak, says, okay, you know what, I'm going to carve out a way for those who have a burning Yetzirah to be a Malatayna, and in this way, they won't do Avedus. So that's what it sounds like this Medrash is saying. And this was already noticed by the Yefei Toyar. The Yefei Toyar is a very important Pirush that was written on the Medrash. The problem with this Pirush was that it was so long. He lived a long time. He lived in the 1500s. In, I, I believe in the, Ottoman, in the Ottoman Empire, it was the rough of a big city. But he wrote such a long pirush, page after page after page. When the printers tried printing the Medrash Rabba with Mepharshim, he was just too long, so they skipped him over. And so he wasn't published. So there hasn't been a... a um, there are, it's, it's a safer that was printed once or twice in the 1500s, and then probably not again. I, 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 at least I haven't seen. Um, but anyway, in, he talks about this, and he writes, Yesh oimrim What is the logic of this 
Gemara, and now it's a Medrash and a Gemara. What is the logic of this rule? It's Kedei Loseis, Makan Leyetzerara, Lanois, by a place for the Yetzirah to find an outlet in Yisava Ledvar HaIsser, if it indeed craves something forbidden. And so that it doesn't end up doing Averis. And then he says, if you read the Tanchuma that we just read, that's what it sounds like uh, over here. Of course, there's a little bit of a problem with this. Because mainly when it comes to Chazer, Let's say a yid wakes up with a burning tithe of a chazer. He says, oh, don't do that, Veda. I'm going to give you shibuta fish. And he eats it and he feels good. Okay, I, I can work with that. Yeah? But go to some of the other examples. Uh, let's say a, 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 a person has a tithe for a ish fish chazer. I'm sorry, this is what, the, grusha, the, the solution here is not a solution. The grusha b'chaya b'ala. Let's say chazer shalom, a yid has a tithe to have relations with his ish as ach. So you can say, yavama. What if there isn't the case of your mama? You know what I mean? So it's like, for some of the examples, it doesn't work. But for some of them, it does. Okay, so it's a little bit of a challenge with the theory. But uh, we hear, we hear what the theory is. And by the way, some daily Israel, when they write about this, the Chacham Seifer, he thinks about it in this way. This is one way of understanding this particular one. There's a, another way. Let's move to the second beer. The second beer comes from the Shalah. And the Shalah <coughs> is right as follows. Vikoshe. He has this question. Vichi isha chashuva kamo yalta. Such a special woman like yalta. Tedaber in Baylor of Nachman is going to speak with her husband, Dvorin Ke'ele. These words, Asher heim lefum riyata Dvorin Betelet, sounds like Dvorin Betelet. This is what a husband and wife, special husband and wife are going to talk about. Okay, halavaya, I would say. But anyway, but he, what he says is that for yalta, it was a big tzadikah, and Rav Chista is like, unbecoming. What it is? It sounds like a, a foolish conversation. The Zu. and not only that, Razal in the Talmud, and they put this. Why did the rabbis put it on the page of the Talmud for us to study this? Um, okay, then skip a paragraph. He says, "Pirish Abba Moedizas," and now he gives a teaching from his father, an answer from his father, and he goes on to say the following: You have a passage in the Sifra that says. You know, there's two different perspectives that you can have when it comes to Averis. One is, I really, 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 really want to do the Avera. We'll talk, eat Chazer. Oh, but God said no, so I'm not going to do it. That's one perspective. Another one is, Chazer, say, the Abisha said no, I hate it, it's disgusting, I'm nauseous by it. Okay, so who's the better Jew? Which one of these responses is the better Jew? So the Rambam, uh, so what does he say? So in the, in the Titus Koinim, in the Sifra, the Medrash, one of the Tanoim says, the better attitude is to say, Mitzidi, I want to do it. I'm interested in doing it. It looks kishmak, it looks attractive. attractive and guess what? I'm not going to do it. Why? Because Abishter, I have a relationship with God. He said, no, no is no. That's a better level. This is what he says. Like, but Pashas, why? Shows your loyalty to Hashem. Shows your loyalty to Hashem. Inside you, you would do it. Your only reason you're not eating the food is only because of God. Oh, that mama shows your loyalty to God. Okay. Then there's a famous Rambam. The Rambam comes along and says, oh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Before we go and run away with this principle, let's clarify. When are we talking about and what not? He says, if you look at what this Tana says, it's very clear this Tana is talking about things like kosher and treif. Things that aren't moral questions. It's talking about things that are being other mamakas. There, I agree, we can have that. But with Gneva, we can't have that. We can't have people walking around saying, Betsam, I'm, I'm ready to steal. Betsam, I'm ready to punch you in the face. Now, but then, the Evisha said, no, so I'm not going to do it. We don't want people like that. So when it comes to the Yonim, you know, what's, so what's the dividing line? If it makes sense. When it comes to laws, that ethical people, when we, when, you know, those moments when you're able to sit and reflect, and you know what's good for a society. When it comes to those types of laws, there you have to say, I'm repulsed by theft. Absolutely repulsed. I'm repulsed by murder. That has to be your feeling. When it comes to something that doesn't harm another person, and you can have a successful society where everyone's eating shrimp, the chayim, that's where the Nambam says, this teaching kicks in, where you're supposed to say, by the way, I desire it. Okay. There's a, a limitation, a further limitation, that was introduced by the Maggid. The Maggid of Israel, Al Tarebe Kotum Lekutetere, who says, hold on, even when it comes to eating shrimp, I don't know if I want to have people walking around all day saying, I'm misavit to shrimp, I'm misavit to shrimp, but no, Ebishter. Why? Because uh, there's a strong fear that the, the person's going to end up uh, committing the sin. If you're thinking about it so much and you, how much you desire it and you want it, so uh, you're going to come to consume it. So the Magad says that a further limitation to this rule. It's interesting, you have the Rambam did his limitation, then the Magad did his. What's the Magad's limitation? The Magad's limitation is that it only applies 
to uh, what he says is tzaddikim. Only applies to tzaddikim. Doesn't apply to Bali Shkula. In other words, if someone struck, the way, this is the way I will say. This is the way I will say. I don't know, I can't say the original. You know, when they use the word tzaddikim, Bali Shkula, you need to know exactly what they meant. But this is what I think of it. If one is a person who struggles with that specific Indian, then you're not supposed to say, I want to do it. Because you know you struggle in that area. You know it's an assignment for you. So there, you have to train yourself to say, I'm repulsed and nauseated by it. But, I don't think it means you have to mamish be a tzaddik. If in this particular Indian, the way you are, you, the, the idea is v'chlau apkafret from you, and it's not an assignment or whatever, so then, yes, then, then, then it's okay to, to say, that's and I want to do it. Because you're so far from it. No, but then I'm not doing it because of the Abish. Okay, fine. So this is this oh, teaching. Huh? I see you lying. Hey, but call the up to back with you, then you should say, I really want to do it. But if it's not up to back with you, then. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, up to correct in a sense uh, that there, it's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen. That's the way I think it. That's the way I understand it. If, if, put it this way if someone came into Shul on Yom Kippur with a pie of pizza, between Musaf and, and Mincha. Okay? What are the chances that you're going to eat that? It's not, it's not going to happen. I know you. It's Pasha not going to happen. Whatever the Altar says about a tzaddik in Tanya, that is like, it's not happening. The sin is not happening. I say, at the same time, so here you can say, you know what? I would like to eat some pizza. That's how I like to eat the pizza. And it's true. But I also know it's not going to happen. That's the way I, I think there is a space between the joints to have uh, to have both. Okay, why is all this relevant? Zakta Shalah. So Shalah says, oh, so are you supposed to say when it comes to uh, Isurim, I want to do it. As long as it's kosher. Um, as long as relations. You're not talking about things that are hurting other people. So the Rambam's uh, qualification is not relevant. So in other words, a Yid is supposed to say, Afshi, I want to do that later. How can you say you want to do that later? You never ate Chazan. How can you say you want to do it? Ah, so the Abishur gives you an equivalent to Chazer. The Abishur gives you an equivalent. So also, it's not going to work for all of them. Okay, because some of those uh, the relations, it doesn't work so well. But for the food, it works pretty good. The Abishur gave you an equivalent to Chazer. You eat it, you say, hmm, this is really good. Achi, I want to eat Chazer, but I'm not doing it because the Abishur said. This is the Shalah's father. His answer into why Yalta has this. All of a sudden, it's an important conversation. It's a very important conversation. Why? Because... This is what enabled Shemitah HaMitzvah. So in other words, to bring it to the modern conversation about imitation products, no, forget mutter. Forget mutter. It's a mitzvah. A mitzvah to eat imitation products. Why? Because now you're able to say, actually, I want it, but I'm not going to do it because of it. In the first explanation, it's only connected to So that's why the way people talk about imitation products is, yes, we know that people eat Tvarim Asurim, so here's a kosher outlet. Okay, that's the first explanation. The second explanation is what do you mean? It's a mitzvah, it's a good thing, according to this beer of the Mendrish, because it allows the person to say, actually, he wants to do that. Man. This is the Shalom. Okay. Yes? For the kosher, only for half this stuff. Yes, it doesn't work for the relations. Again. Does he cover the fact that it doesn't work? No, he does not mention that it doesn't work for, it didn't work for, the, yeah. for the first beer. It didn't work for the first one either. No, the the he, next beer is going to work. He touched, did he mention the Rambam or you were the one? He mentions the Rambam. Uh, does he mention the Rambam? No, he doesn't mention the Rambam. Sorry. He does not mention the Rambam. Okay. So now, this is what he says. He finishes off and says, Umama oid masku He really loves it. He, he thinks his father totally clinched it. Okay. Number next. There's a next explanation. The next explanation is going to work for all of them. The next explanation will work for all of them. And this actually connects with this week's parsha in another way. This week's parsha is Shmini. And so we learn about the laws of kosher including the fact that a chazer is not kosher. And so that's one connection to this week's parsha. But also, this week's parsha is parsha's para. Okay. Parsha's para is where we read about the mitzvah of para aduma. In Parakech of Rambam, we just finished learning Hilchas para aduma. Okay. So we've been thinking about this a little. Our nusach, parsha's para, is a regular Shabbos nusach. But as we've mentioned this in other classes, if you dive in a Nusach Ashkenaz and a Nusach Svar, they have special tzulis, just like they have special tzulis on every Yom Tif. There are special tzulis that are added to the davening for Parshas Par. And these are the Yotzeris that could go into Birchat Krishma, and these are special inserts that go into the Shemayna Esrei that said in the first few brachas, just like we have on the first day of Pesach and on Shemini Aseris by Tal and by Geshem. That style material they have for Parshas Par. I don't know if every shul does it, there's different men hung obviously, some people skip. Original Ashkenazi has it. And davening, therefore, in Parshish Par is a longer, uh, long davening. It's the same for all Dalit Parshish. 
within this genre of piyutim that they do, and the, the truth is that we do Rosh Hashanah and Kippur as well, there's actually different names for it. Maybe before Rosh Hashanah, we're going to take a closer look at this. But basically, there's one of the piyutim is called a siluk. What's a siluk? A siluk is that you just, you finish the, the first two brachas, you, you finish Magan Avram, and you finish Machai Amisim. In each one of those brachas, you already inserted a few piyutim. Now you're getting close to Kedusha. Before Kedusha, you can do a grand, a grand piyut. A bit of, uh, the heavy stuff is going to be there. And it's called siluk because it's like you're leaving. This is the last thing. This is the grand finale of this series of piyutim. So the siluk for Parshas Para has... Yeah, it's a very similar style to Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. We do it that way as well. Yeah, there's a siluk. There's a siluk, yeah. So the siluk for Parshas Para, which was composed by Rev. Lazar Akalir, whose name we mentioned in previous uh, time, he's the most famous uh, of all the Pythonim. He has, look, look what he writes over there. He writes, We can't talk about the strength of your wonders. We can't talk about the reach of your laws. We can't understand the strength of your doings. We can't decode the depth of your wonders. Uh, even things that are explained are still concealed. Even things that are still are revealed, they're still concealed. Even things that are explained, they are uh, sealed away. Um, uh, what's happening here? Uh, he, he's talking about how the Ebishter is way beyond our understanding. And he's, what does he mean when he says things that are explained are concealed? What he means is even when the Torah goes and explains a mitzvah, how much of it do you really understand? Even when it's explaining, we barely uh, understand. And then he goes and says, Matir me asurais mutarais. God takes from what's forbidden and makes things permitted. And noisin mitmeyos toiris, and things that are off limits due to tumah, or which could also mean kosher, uh, he makes the toiris. He, he, he says that it's pure. He says that it is tar. And then he gives examples. Mina chelav, instead of fat, you could eat shayman ali. There's, as we know, when it comes to chelav, there's certain uh, chelavs that are forbidden, certain fats, but we all know you have a shtikol steak, there's fat there, right? So there's certain chelavs that's motor, some that's asr. So he's referring to that. Shoymen alev, like a dikta shtikol fat in an animal, it's motor. Okay? Chelavs asr. The fat of the lev, motor. Min adam, blood is off limits, but you have the tchoil, the spleen, the kaved adam, and the liver. Umi basar bechalav, chechal hachalav. That's the... The other that we saw earlier. Mikile vegadim, you can't have kilayim, tchelas pasadim. That's the, the tzitzis that we saw. Me'eshas ach, you can't marry a, a sister in law, you have yibum. Me'eshas ish, a married woman you can't have, yefas toyar leish. Yefas toyar is an example of a, a, a married woman. This is already, there's a few differences in the list, we'll talk about it in a second. Metumas nidas isha, fine, there's taras pasule isha, this is uh, permitted. And then he goes on to give another two examples. The Seir, La Azazel on Yom Kippur, it brought Kapara to Am Yisrael. The people who worked with it became Tommy. The Para Aduma, it brought Tara, as we, this is why it's uh, for Parshas Para, it brought Tara, you sprinkle the ashes on the person who's tme, or who is impure, and the person becomes... A, but the person who did the sprinkling, he becomes Tommy. As well, and therefore he ends this off saying, "Bechain, therefore, and lahavin soy toyer tzacha, you can't understand the secrets of the Torah, the loizikukim rasecha, and the purity of your speech, and seder of gzeir tzacha, the purity of the You can't understand." In other words, what's happening over here? He's writing a appeal. What's the nekuda of the appeal this week's parshas para? He's saying parshas para is about para aduma. Para aduma tells us what that when it comes to the mitzvahs, as much as you understand, there's so much, so much that you don't understand. Right? So, he turns this into a much bigger theme. And he makes it a general statement, and he brings other examples. For example, the Seer Lazos, on Yom Kippur. Also there, you see, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's paraduma, it doesn't make sense. You, you cause Tara, and you become Tomei. Same thing with Seer Lazos. And it is in that piyot where he throws in our Gemara. It is in that piyot where he throws in, <laughs> this makes sense. Chelev, no. Shuman Alev, yeah. Dam, no. But Kaveh, yeah. In other words, what we're seeing here is another beer to this issue. Why does this principle exist? Very simple. This principle exists because mitzvahs are the Ebishiz Rasin that are higher than Tavadas. And God wanted to message us and convey to us and make it so obvious to us that it is that way. And therefore, imagine if all Chelev is off limits. You say, okay, well, maybe there's something, there's an issue with Chelev. No! 
Not all chaylev is off. Some chaylev is mutter, some chaylev is asr. Also, what is it? This is what I said. And likewise with all these other things. Because it's inconsistent, it shows you that it's not about the acts themselves. What it is, is that the Abishur is giving you an opportunity to connect with him, to do a mitzvah, to listen to him, to show your loyalty to him. And so therefore, it comes out in these very unique ways that shows you that it's the Abishur's data. This is a new way of understanding this, and this would apply to all of them across, uh, all of them across the board. Now, there are some differences between his list and our list. So for example, Chelev, he had, instead of Chelev, what did he have? He had Shuman within the Behemoth, rather than Chelev Chai. That's one difference. That's number one. Number two, with, I'm not going to count blood where he mentioned also the spleen. I'm not going to count that. The other one that he had that is different is when it came to uh, adultery, to the Eishas Ish, instead of saying, marrying a divorced uh, woman, he says, Yifas Toya. Okay? And we use that for a non-Jew. And he doesn't have any corresponding heter for relations with a non-Jew. He doesn't have that. He just has uh, Eishas Ish. Why? Why Eishas Ish? Because Yafas Tayar, when a soldier captured her, she could have been married to a non-Jew. So it was Eishas Ish. Okay. Um, uh, so, so, so those are a, a number of differences that you have. Huh? So you're asking, are they halach? Does the Torah recognize the marriage as a marriage that turns them into Eishas Ish? It's a good question. I hear you. At least on a practical human level, it's uh, that way. But, um, but yeah, I don't know why not. The Rambam says, I don't know, I need to look more in tip. I, I, I don't see why not. I don't see why not. I'm not sure. I don't know. It requires you. So Toysus already noticed that Toysus is saying these piyutim. They're doing this. And they know the Gemara. And the list doesn't match up. So look what Toysus writes. Tosas writes, "Besiluk shall parshas para yasad Rabbi Lazar a color min hadam tchoil hadam." So Tosas actually had instead of kaved, it was only the spleen. Mitumas nida taras besule isha, which is different from uh, our uh, original Gemara because in our it just said dam toyar. Okay, it's not such a big difference. Ume eishas ish yefas toyar le ish uchenegat kusis loy pira. She does not have anything corresponding to relations with a guy. Okay, so where did this come from? We have Dr. Talmud Babli. Dr. Talmud says, Hakel as al piyar yersham. Yersham. What's the problem? We don't have a yersham. We don't have a yersham. There's no yersham. Okay. We don't have a yershami, but so maybe there's a passage in yershami that didn't come down to us. Possible. But there is a vayikr rabba. And we know these midrashim come from Eretz Yisrael. And I think, I have a feeling that I've seen in other places that sometimes the Rishonim say, Yerushalmi, and what they mean is the Eretz Yisrael Dikha Madrashim. So it could be that's what's happening here. Here you have Vayikra Rabba, and the list here in Vayikra Rabba is exactly what Rabbi Lazar HaKolir uh, 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 has. And, um, and, uh, and, but it also you get additional examples here that you didn't have in the other one. So you have, um, if you go to the, um, if you look at this list here, Let's see, go to the second paragraph. Rab Abba, Rab Yenus, and B'Shen, Rab Levi, Yomar. Yosem, Rab Masha, Sarek, Lecha, Yitzhar, Tilach. More than I forbade, I created Heter for you. I'm not sure what that line means. So then he goes through the list. First he mentions Nida. Then he mentions Eishas Ish. And he says what Rabbi Lazar Kaler says. Not the Grusha. Yitzhar, Tilach, Es HaShvuya. The captive woman, which is the Eishas Yifas Tair. Okay? So this works very well with Rabbi Lazar HaKalir uh, had. But there are other, other examples here. Isha, if you go two lines down, Isha vas hachoysa bechayim, a man is not allowed to marry two sisters while they're alive. Okay, but you can marry a second sister after she died. Okay, so that's a new example that we didn't have uh, before. And if you go a few lines down, chelev is off limits, but what's permitted? Hitar t'chaz hashuman. Okay, that's also the way Rabbi Lazar Kaler had, within the behemoth itself, the fat of the animal. Okay, so altogether we, we're dealing with around now 11 different examples of Isurim. They're still all about food, relations, or one example uh, of, of clothing. And already the Yafei Tayar, who we quoted earlier, he noticed that there is this uh, new interpretation that rather than looking at it as, 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 uh, give, as creating space for the Yisahara for an outlet, and rather than looking at it as, as giving you the opportunity to say uh, Ashi, it's, it's about demonstrating the Xeroness within the mitzvah. And that's what he says in number 10. He says that if you read um, 
uh, the Medrash, if you read the Medrash of Ayikra Rabba, it really sounds like this is all about God making it so clear that uh, the, the non-predictability in all of this is what makes it so clear to everyone that this is the Abish's Rasa. Okay, so we've seen so far three explanations. Let's move on to another explanation. This one comes from a very, very interesting source. There's a Gemara in Baba Basa, as we know. Gemara, from time to time, when it has a series of things it's going to talk about, it drops you a simon. Right? Remember the famous simon? Yal Kagam. It's one of the first ones we learn when we learn Baba Metziah. This is the six uh, things where the halacha is like a... Which one? Abaya, Rava? I don't remember. So... Then you have many others where it's about to list the sugi. We're going to ask six questions, so I'll give a simon. In Baba Basra, Tafmen Baba Medbez, there's a simon, Amalek simon. Amalek simon. Why? Because it stands for Arev, Malva, Lekeach, and Kabbalah, which are the four things that are going to be under the discussion of the Gemara. Okay. As far as I know, the first one to say, hello, is the Yaivetz, which is interesting, because this Gemara existed for many hundreds of years, and many people are commenting, but no one said hello until the Yaivetz. Um, uh, Yaivetz writes, Arev, Malva, Lekeach, and Kapsa. These are four things that the Gemara is about to discuss. So it gives you this acronym to, so that you know. So look what the Yaivetz writes. He writes, Chiddush. Titus says, blot out the name of Amalek, don't remember it, erase it, right? Or remember to erase it, but, and here, you're making it a simon in the Gemara, it's a, a little bit of a bizarre thing. Okay, uh, there's a sefer, Megala Amukai, and Megala Amukai says that Amalek is, uh, Megala Amukai says, is, uh, is, uh, he says that uh, Amalek is Gematria, it's not Gematria, it's Rosh Tevis, Amra, Moshe, Levi, and Kahas. And he explains, and there's a Rishim of the Rebbe, where the Rebbe gets into the explanation, why is Amalek corresponding to Amra, Moshe, Levi, and Kos? When the Rebbe is in the Rishim explaining this, he says, by the way, uh, the Yavit, you know, asks this question. The Rebbe refers to, like, how are you talking? And it's the same question on the Megala Mukas. What gives you a right to invoke Amalek for such holy people? Uh, why is this considered even uh, a good idea? Alamai, because it's a very important thing that's conveyed by referencing Amalek, which the Rebbe develops in that Rishima. Okay, but in our case, this is the question the Yavis asks. So, what's the answer? See, he writes like this. Ulai matu loy remez minatoira, but my desayin kro loy tishkach. Shetevas loy musekes betam tipcha. He says something very, very interesting over here. We know in trap, there's two different types of trap. There's one type of trap that leads you into the next word. And there's one type of trap that essentially pauses you from the next word. For example, Mercha Tipcha is a great example, right? You have Mercha Tipcha, Vaidaber Hashem, so Vaidaber is Mercha, Hashem, right? Vaidaber Hashem, so the Vaidaber, the way you're singing it, leads into Hashem, there's no hefsek there. On the other hand, between Vaidaber Hashem, El Moshe, okay, I'm messing up my, my uh, it's probably not even a Mercha Tipcha, but um, <laughs> help me out here with the trap. But the bottom line is, you can have a Tipcha after a so that's an example between a tipcha and the next word where it's, there's a little break. Where's the nafkamina? There's a big nafkamina. Because there are rules in where uh, if you end, let's say, b'nei, uh, uh, if you end a word, the chfais, it says b'nei um, boy. Uh, so the, because of the word b'nei ends with a yud, so the bias loses its pintala and it's Dagesh, and now it's Bnei Voyez. That's the way it rules, certain letters that cause that, right? But that's, what if under Bnei is a Tipcha? If under Bnei is a Tipcha, because the Tipcha trap is a break, so therefore the rule won't apply, and you will read Bnei Voyez, and the Bays will be there. So in other words, that has Okay, so what's, the, what's he saying over here? He says, Lai Sishkach. There's a pause there. What happens is a pause. The pause, when you have a pause, and I'll tell you what its source is in a minute, they have a pause. It's, La is of niche, but sometimes, yeah, tishkach is fargesen. That's what he's saying here. In other words, loy tishkach. You shouldn't forget la, to, to erase Amalek, but sometimes you should forget to erase Amalek. That hefsek thing gives you. Where is this coming from? This comes from a passage in the Zoyar about Aseras Atibris. You know how there's a joke they used to say about loy signaries that they, they touch Lloyd to Emzol Gavin and like it's like no no it's not with a vav it's with an aleph don't steal the emesis there's a, a zayar it says if it said Lloyd Sirtach 
then you would go out, and like some people today, you'd be anti-war. Anti-war, why? Can never kill. You would be anti-death penalty. Why? Can never kill. Like Terzak, says in the So it's, we read this two timing, this Tama Elyon and Tama Tachtin. In Tama Tachtin, you read Lai Tzitzach, Lai Tzinaf, Lai Tzinaf, and there, there is no Hefzit between the Loi and the Tzignai. But in the Tama Elyon that we read, when we read, it's Lai Tzignai, there's a Tipcha there, and it's a break. Why is there a break, Dr. Zoyar? Because it's a hefsik. Loi, you shouldn't. But sometimes you should. Tignai. Yeah, this is what it's saying. What's the sometimes you should? A court has to sometimes execute someone. If you have to go out to war, then this is what you should do. If it's a case of a right, if, then you need to kill. This is what the Zoyar says. He says the same thing about uh, Loi Tignai. What's the example for Loi Tignai? It says, imagine you're learning with your Rebbe. And your Rebbe says, you understand? Okay, you understand, but you want him to say it again. Why? Because you want to get it better. He, the Zoyer says, in that case, you're allowed to, you're allowed to steal his mind. And he's going to say, no, I'd Rebbe, I don't understand. And then he's going to say it again. Or it's a, let's say, uh, it's just one example that he gives. He gives another example. In a court, in a court where you need a, so there are examples, where lay, take knife, don't, but sometimes you should, steal. This is the case that he gives. Even Loy Sinov, he gives a case. Where's Loy Sinov? He says, if you had Loy Sinov, and you read Loy Sinov, it depends how you understand the word Neof, but you can have the extreme reading that says that a person shouldn't get married, shouldn't have children, and shouldn't have uh, Simchas Mitzvah with his wife, Chas So it's Loy, but in this way you should Sinov. That's the way the Zoyar uh, says it. So the Yaivitz is quoting that, and he's saying, maybe that's what's going on here with Amalek. We say, you got to forget, you got to for- erase, erase, erase. Right? And don't forget what they did. And don't for- Sometimes you should forget what they did. Sometimes you should forget what they did, which means you're not going to erase them. Okay, when? Why? why? Why should there be an exception to the rule? Why are we suspending the mitzvah of Mechiyas Amalek? Says, there, says he, you, you want to know why? The Chom Ad-Asar Achmana Shari. Everything that he forbade, there's a corresponding Heter, and here we just learned. There's a Heter, to add one to the list now. There's a Heter to not erase Amalek, and which is what we're doing here. And he quotes our Gemara, but why? Bring in this disgusting being into the base Hamedish, to break his power, and to take out the spark of good that is in Amalek. In other words, he's presenting here a theory, and I think he means. This is a fourth explanation on how we look at this Gemara. And that is, every single thing has a spark. Chazar has a spark. Every Dover Asar has a spark. Every, every one of those experiences has a spark. And that spark has to be redeemed. How do you redeem that spark? So the Amalek, normally, we're like, erase, erase, erase. Blot them out. But how do you redeem the spark? Once we're going to bring him into the base Mandarish, we're going to put him on the dock of the Gemara, he's going to become a simon, and then that redeems the spark. And all that I said, it sounds like he's saying here, is the spark in the, a negative shtickle flesh or a negative shtickle chela that you're not allowed to eat, somehow in the corresponding kosher dikka one that God didn't forbid, when eating that, you redeem the spark from the corresponding uh, forbidden one. This is what it sounds like he's saying, although you're not interacting with the forbidden. You're eating something that's kosher. You're eating a shuman halev. It sounds like from here, by eating the Shuman Halev, there is a relationship between Shuman Halev and Chelev, obviously. And due to that relationship, by eating the Shuman Halev, you're freeing and redeeming the spark that's in this terrible clip. And if so, this would be a fourth explanation for why we have this principle. Which brings us to explanation number five, and that is the Sikha the Rebbe. The Rebbe spoke about this number of occasions, but most of the time, very the kids there's one time the Rebbe gave a, a, a shtikol arichis, to this, and this was in Tavshin Menchah. The context over here is as follows. The Rebbe asks a very interesting question. <clears throat> interesting? It's a Rebbe-style question. We know that Torah existed before the world came into being. In Lashen, Apayim Shana Kodma Torah Leila. Okay, so you need to imagine that you're reading the Torah and the world doesn't exist. Okay, so you're reading the Torah and you're up to Parsha Shmoiz and it says, Vayoimer. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of other issues to overcome, but let's pick up at the Pasuk that, that Moshe sees uh, the person about to strike the other person, and he says, How are you going to understand that? How are you going to understand what that passage means? Okay, he's saying, Moshe is a ruchni sticker thing, but what, what is Lama Sakariacha? What, what does that mean? 
how does, who's hitting? How does someone doing an immoral act before the world is even created? This is the question that the Rebbe asks. Um, uh, how, well, how are you supposed to understand in Yonim Bilti Ritsuyim? Negativity, before you have Chet, you, chet, uh, uh, chet uh, Sadas didn't happen yet. So all of that negativity didn't happen yet. So how are you supposed to even understand what does this passage look like in a, in a world in where there isn't evil? So the Rebbe says as follows. Let's read a little inside on page 3, the second paragraph. Biyadua Habir Bazeh. So the explanation is as follows. All of the things that it says in the Torah, it's the way each thing is in its root source. There, it's the epitome of good and of holiness. Everything comes from God. So, in other words, everything there is holiness and goodness. It's after many, many, many different concealments. It turned into something negative down here. So in other words, yeah, yeah, you, if you're reading the Torah 2,000 years before the world is created, when none of this exists, you read those words, those words have meaning. What exactly is the meaning? We don't know. But we, one thing we know about it, it's not negative uh, meaning positive meaning, and that was nostalgia into a negative event down here in this world that one person actually tried hitting the other person, which is why we reread the Torah down here in this world, we're like, oh, it's a story about negativity, but really, if you go all the way back from where this event came from, in its original source, it's actually only a positive event, why? Because it's only God, only Kedusha, only goodness over there, so it must be that that's the case. That never that says the next step. You know something? Sometimes we get a sneak peek down here, Lamata, how things are Lamaila. The Yisaitim is that. The Baal Tassi Stachaba Rai Tzobar Alma, because the Abishter looked into the Ten and created the world. What does that tell you? That goodness and God is reflected in the world. Because what's the blueprint of the world? The blueprint of the world is this Torah. Which Torah? The Torah that exists before you have any negativity. So, so then we're able to sometimes see in this physical world, how things are at the roots. The Eishloimar, and we can suggest, this is one of the explanations in the Gemara called the Asalon Rachmana Sharalon Kavasei, that for every forbidden item, there is a car, par, or, or experience, there is a corresponding, there is a corresponding heter. What is, as we've been asking this whole evening, what is the function of this rule? Why is this a good idea? as Yeder Israel Lamata, is toy viktusha bim koiroi. Because we want to show that every negative uh, thing down here in this world, really in its root, it's kosher, and its root is good. What's the Rebbe saying over here? You have down here a rabbit. You're not allowed to eat a rabbit. Okay, so what would you say in the language of Chsidah? Say it's klippa, right? Shosh klippa satmei. You've got to stay away from the rabbit. One second. It was created by the Abishtha. Created by the Abisha, where he looked into the Torah, goodness and holiness, and he created. So it must be that in its root, this rabbit is toys. Never then, what happened? That things could get detached from what they really are. We know as human beings sometimes is who we are, and then we could sometimes get lost. So, so to uh, physical items, God creates, and they kind of get detached, and they lose touch with what their original source is. But the original source is Pake Ketusha. Fine. So now I can tell you, just believe it. And then I could say, hold on a second, you know this rabbit you're not allowed to eat? There's another chet that's down here in this physical world. And it corresponds to it. You know why it corresponds to it? Because it comes from the same shade. And, and it's mutter down here in this world, which reminds you that the rabbit also, also came from a place that's, uh, that, that's mutter. The rabbit lost that identity. This other thing didn't lose that identity. So it's the corresponding heter where you say, one second, I'm Chaylev, you're Shuman. We both come from the same source. You turned into negativity. Ah, but the, the etzem, if you scratch back far enough, you come from Ketusha. In other words, like this. Negativity does not have any independent existence, according to Ketusha. There's no such a thing as, like, Satan swoops in and has, like, a Metzius. No, no, no. The, the Metzius of Ra, according to Ketusha, is a corruption of toys. It's a very interesting idea. Anything that's Ra... It's basically a corruption of toys. Everything that starts out as toys. Ra means 
we lost touch with what the thing really is, and we went off on our own. That's what rise. We're, we're, we're forgetting what we're about, and we're going to become our own type of thing. Okay, you're losing touch with your Shader Shemakar. That's what rise. And w- w- why is that an empowering statement? It's very empowering, because then evil, basically, doesn't have independent existence. In fact, evil is only the corruption of something that's toys. So in other words, really, you live in a world where everything is toys. Uh, some things lost touch with that concept and that idea, and it gives you more of the power that you're going to one day be able to overcome this. Because at the end of the day, it's not a real mitzvah. It's just something that is a corruption of toys. But the, the framework of what Olam Haza is, is all toys. Okay, so again, the reminder of it is that, yeah, this thing is negative, negative, negative. Oh, but there's something else, very similar. Why is it similar? Because it comes from the same Shadish. And this is Mutter. Ah, that reminds me that this too also comes from that Shadish. And over then it lost its uh, thing. This is the Rebbe's explanation. The Rebbe then goes on to give more dugmois of the heter that corresponds to Isser. So for example, you're not allowed to kindle the fire on Shabbos. But in the Mishkan, Beis HaMikdosh, not only it was permitted to kindle a fire, you have to. Then the Rebbe gives another example. Marrying a woman and her sister, which is one of the examples that the Gemara uh, actually already, not the Gemara, one of the Midrashim had that example. The Rebbe brings that and says, but look, we see that Yaakov did it. Okay, so it's not like in a thing that it's mutter for us, but we see there's a concept of heter for it. And then the Rebbe says that we find many other examples. And then the Rebbe comes back, let's read the last paragraph of Rosh Alama Sakar that in Yom Fusakar Yacha, in Kedusha, is Ledukma, the Akaf and Reifa Bechtei Larafis as Adam, the Adla Shleimos, Mitzvah Smila, was Tos Kumtur Haka, the Yitzhiya's Dan. In other words, yeah, yeah, yeah. Haka, in Torah, the way it exists, is a positive thing. And you know something? That's why in our world today, we have Haka that's positive. What's I call as positive? When a doctor has to strike a patient, or when a moil has to give a bris. That's positive haka. And that's a, that gives you a main of what haka is in a world that's all holiness and good. It just happens to be that we also have negative haka that's here uh, in this world. And therefore, in other words, if, if a yid has a tithe to lift his hand to hit someone else, really, that we should, what we need to know about that is that's a corruption of something positive. God has a concept of haka that's positive. And it reflects itself in this world in a few ways and a few examples. And therefore He gave you that. Okay, now you're choosing to go against that power that God gave you, which was for a mitzvah, and you're going against what it is. Okay, so then it's like you take a beautiful painting and you're using it as a cutting board. Okay, so it's a big rachmanis when a person does that. And this is the Rebbe's answer to the question of where do we see haka, uh, beruchnis, uh, be, um, uh, where do we see haka in Torah before the existence of the world. So with that, there are five different explanations as to why we have this principle. Again, number one, Pashat, to give into the Yetzirah, to give him an outlet. Number two was the Shalaz explanation where he was saying that we want to create a desire within you to the Azera. Number three was the beer that it's about Parshas Para. It's reflecting the fact that it's random. The Torah Mitzvah is a shtickle random which keeps you, keeps you off your toes and reminds you of the Xedus on the Abishur. Number four, this is how you redeem the sparks from the negative to Yavit. And number five, the Sikh of the Rebbe, in where the Dover Hamutter corresponding to the Isser reminds you that the Isser itself is only corruption of something that's positive. Now, we already have been referencing that there's a conversation to be had about the halachic permissibility of these foods. So there's a chidah, very interesting chidah. The chidah, meaning imitation foods. The chidah lived in the 1700s. He has a sefer and he writes like this. Number 13. The chidah had a lot to do with gvir. Why? The chidah was a fundraiser. He came from Eretz Yisrael. And he traveled around Europe to raise money for the Kehillah and Eretz So obviously he had to do his virin. Then uh, he stayed in Europe and then came a Rav in Livorno. Livorno at this time in the 1700s was only Svardim. And these guys were wealthy up to who knows where. These guys were loaded. And he became their Rav. So he's talking to a Gvir over here. And Chakar Be'inyan Amon. This Gvir had a question about the Mon. You, you, you decide if this is a Gvirish type of question. Um, 
The man was mishtana, vaya tama ketama davar shechef, chafetz, whatever you wanted to taste like it could taste. So in chashav lechol chazer, a shor is surin. Let's say the person had a mind chazer, vetama on baman, and he taka tasted it. Im aved is surah. Did he do an isur or not? This is the question that the gvir asked the chida. Ve shafti, and I answered, the chiva in the yadea, the masha oichalu hater, because he knows that it's taka hater. Sagi, that's enough. Varaya, evidence, yalta amra. She quotes the Gemara and Chul. In other words, the Chida quotes our Gemara to say that that Jew, he tried tasting and he did taste Chazer. Totally fine. Why? Because what's the test? The test is Pasha. The ingredients, kosher or not kosher, that's the only thing. Kasher is not about taste. It's not the Abish didn't want you to have a certain taste. It's about these foods can't go in a Yiddish mouth. So if it's another food, I don't care, so it's fine. And so because of this Chida and this Gemara and these sources that we looked at, so generally the Paiskim's attitude has been that all these imitation products uh, should, be, uh, should be kosher. Uh, that's normally. However, I do have to tell you that there is a Sefer where Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein writes that he spoke to his Rabbi Shver, Rabbi Yashiv, and he told Rabbi Yashiv that he wants the, the Russians in Israel, they want to have pig, so we're going to make uh, imitation pig and they're going to eat it and and uh, Rabbi Yashiv was not really happy about it. He said, you know how we have this concept of, uh, yeah, it's mutter, but stay far away from it. There's a, he, there's a Gemara in Cholin, for example, like if you served as a judge that allowed uh, the product to go from A to B, then don't go ahead and buy it from B later, because then it just looks like that you rule that way to get it. So the Lashon is, harchik min or hazer min akir. Be careful from these negative, uh, from, the, from something that doesn't look right. So Rabbi Yashif said, eh, it doesn't look right that we're going, we're making chazer and whatever. Okay? Then he said, but the Chida said this, so then maybe it's, uh, he wasn't so sure about it. Okay, but generally most Paiskim don't, uh, don't, don't, don't have this concern. Paiskim say that, um, first of all, if it's to save people from Averis, then for sure it should be done. And even if it's not about saving people from Averis, to come and to say something like this is usher. Never then, you need to be careful about that people shouldn't mistake it for the real thing. And that we have the almond milk, for example, the, if a person's having almond milk with basar, they, the Shulchanar says you have to have shkedim on the table. Okay, whether we do shkedim on the table today, or there are other, I think place can say today you don't even do that. But the point is that uh, assuming no one's going to make an error to think that it's the real thing to say that it's usher, uh, most poiskim and the hachshenim give hachshenim to it, and the restaurants are serving it. And there is, as Aaron mentioned, a company called uh, Impossible Pork. And uh, I don't know, the, the OU didn't give them a hachshir, and they said it's not for a lack of reason, just our clients aren't ready, episode nine, our clients aren't ready for this uh, thing yet, and we'll revisit it in a few months or something like that. Um, but that seems to be, uh, in fact, if you go back to the shalom, it's a mitzvah to eat it. Because then you could say, Afshi. Okay. So the other explanations, Lav Dafke comes out that it's a mitzvah to eat it. So these are some of the, uh, of the things that we could uh, see, both from this week's Parsha, in terms of Parsha Shemini and in Parsha's Parah. Uh, and uh, as you see, as mo- most things in Yiddishkeit, there are multiple ways of understanding it. And chaim, chaim. Thank you.